They're already coming in and figure they were. Oh, do me a favor here. The library in Austin sent somebody to go to books. Oh. Because I haven't started. I haven't done a lot. I got a question. Let's change. Let's do it. 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 Let's do it.
first one. And how about you? Is this your first time? Is this the first time? Seven wins. Seven. Seven wins. All right, well, let's get on with our speaker. And we're going to hold these books up as we announce. Hey, if you had any more, we'd have been next. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Sneed B. Pollard the third has written more than, guess what? <laughs> 85 books for young people, including beats, birds, valuing natural wildfires and burned forests, woodpeckers, drilling holes and bagging bugs, and his newest book, Waiting for a Water. His first adult book, Warblers and Woodpeckers, A Father's Son, Big Gear of Birding, recounts the adventures of he, and his son Braden during their 2016 big year, including their epic, I like the, I like the way he uh, attributes Texas, his epic trip to Texas. Sneed is a popular, award-winning speaker and has spoken at numerous birding festivals and events all around. So we're pleased tonight to have with us Sneed Collins. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, the first thing I want to have all of you do is give out a big cheer that we made it to a real live birthday event. Okay? <laughs> and uh, I want to thank you all for coming out here, especially right, you know, at the end of nap time, you guys could still be sleeping off this, these exciting days. Before I get started, I wanted to especially thank uh, Melody Wagoner of the Chamber of Commerce for putting this amazing event together. I cannot imagine how many thousands of hours her and her team have put into making this happen today. And I've been really impressed by all the support from the community to the vendors and the businesses. And I'd also like to uh, thank my friend Jeanette Larson here who helped found the Wings um, Bird Recovery Place here in town, and who also submitted my name for the festival. So thank you very much. Uh, as I just, yeah. <laughs> there, you there you go. There you go. Well, um, you just heard that I've written about eighty-five books for young people, and most of them are about natural history and science. Um, but I did not grow up actually being a birder. In fact, I was one of those very dumb people who said when I was younger, I'm going to wait till I'm older to get into birding. I mean, what a ridiculous concept, right? But I did do that. However, I was very interested in animals growing up, and I blame my parents for that. Uh, I moved to Santa Barbara, California when I was less than a year old. Why? So both my parents could go to school at the University of California there. My mom would become a lifelong high school biology teacher with a special passion for marine mammals. And my dad earned his PhD and became a biology professor at the University of West Florida in Pensacola, which is probably a long day's drive from here. Now, I spent all my summers growing up with my father and my real passion back then were reptiles because Florida, in fact, the whole South, is rich in reptiles. And my dad and I, whenever we had a chance, we'd go out looking for snakes and turtles and lizards, spotting alligators, which were still kind of rare back then when I was a teenager, and unfortunately made a great comeback. And like I said, though, I did get into birds right away. When I went to college, I studied marine biology, and it wasn't until after I graduated that I decided, you know, there's probably enough biologists in the world to save the world. But what there aren't enough people doing is taking what the scientists know and sharing it with the general public. And so right then and there, I decided to write. I had no idea what I was doing at first. I wrote all kinds of different things. I wrote uh, a really bad novel for adults. I wrote some articles about how to catch fish. I lived in California, so I had to write a screenplay, right? It took me about nine years to sell my first book, and it was a book called Sea Snakes, about these highly venomous snakes that live in 
the oceans and the tropics. And since that time, I've been very fortunate to be able to write about all kinds of topics that have interested me, from coral reefs to tropical rainforests. And along the way, I did happen to write a few books about birds. In fact, Beeps is a picture book. It's probably my best-selling book of all time, but it took about 15 years for it to get really popular. So if you have a book out that's not doing well yet, keep your spirits up, right? I also wrote a book called Birds of Prey for a little bit older kids, and that book inspired actually an adventure thriller young adult novel called Black Point that had raptors with some of the main characters. I didn't really start plunging into birding, though, until about seven years ago when I decided I wanted to write a book about my favorite group of birds, woodpeckers. Now, as I often do when I start writing a book, the first thing I did was go and try to find a person who knew about woodpeckers. Fortunately, as they say in the mafia, I knew my guy. His name was Dick Peckham. And I called him up. He's at the University of Montana in Missoula, where I live. And I said, Dick, can you take me out and teach me a little about woodpeckers? And he did. We went out on a beautiful hike one morning and he started showing me different kinds of woodpeckers and sap suckers, you know. But he also started telling me this other story. And that was a story of how important natural wildfires are for woodpeckers and other birds. Well, how can that be? Well, it turns out that when a fire burns a forest, within a few weeks or months, billions of wood-boring eagles descend on the forest. And they start drilling into these dead standing trees and lay their eggs in them. This is the feast of a lifetime, especially for uh, blackbacked woodpeckers, three-toed woodpeckers, and hairy woodpeckers that have the ability to drill into these rock-hard trees to extract the juicy, fat beetle grubs <laughs> out of them there. Now, of course, as they're doing this, they're doing something else. They're drilling out cavities to nest in and roost in. And once they start doing that, it opens up the whole forest for dozens of species of cavity nesting birds that have to nest in holes. And these include many of our favorite species of birds, such as house wrens and mountain bluebirds, and even birds that aren't cavity nesting flock to the burned forest. Why? Because they not only find shelter there, they find food there, I find one more important thing, and that is safety. Turns out that a nice green looking forest is home to a whole bunch of pesky rodents, right? Squirrels and chipmunks that are voracious predators on baby birds and bird eggs. The forest fires clean out these pesky rodents, and nesting success for these cavity nesting birds and other birds skyrockets in the burned forest after a forest fire. So what do we do though when we see a forest fire? Well, we freak out, right? We go, oh, the forest has been destroyed. We have to save the bird. So we go in there and we salvage log these burned dead trees, which the mills don't really like all that much anyway. And then because we remove the trees and all the seed cones that would repopulate the forest, we have to pay people to go in and replant the burn. Whereas if we just left it alone, the forest is perfectly capable of replanting itself. And by the way, when we salvage log, what trees do we take? The large diameter ones that the black factory have to see themselves try. So when I heard this story, I thought, you know, I'm not going to write about woodpeckers. I'm going to write about the importance of forest fires and burn forests to birds. Of course, while I was doing this, one thing I love to do when I write is take my own pictures. So I was going out to these birds with my camera and tripod. And often I bring my young son, Brady, along with me. He's about 11 at the time. 
and um, and we'd see these birds and photograph them. And of course, I had to know what I was taking pictures of, right? So we started learning all the birds and the bird forest and started getting interested in learning to identify our local birds. But the real switch didn't flick on in our birding brains until the following Thanksgiving when my wife rented a movie called The Big Year. <laughs> How many of you have seen The Big Year before? Okay. If you haven't, go watch it tonight. Seriously, it's delightful. And it's about these three almost manic birders who are trying to set the world record for the most ABA, that's American Birding Association, birds uh, that they can see in a single year. And after we were done watching this movie, my son Ray returned to me and said, Dad, we should do a big year. And I thought, oh, okay. Yeah, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, in fact, that first year, it was, we just birded around Missoula. And I think we got about 120, you know, out of what, uh, 600 plus, almost 700 that nest in the ABA area. <laughs> We thought that was pretty good. Well, the next year we didn't do a big year. We just start, kept learning about birds and going out and seeing them, finding where to find them. And by the end of the year, our skills had improved enough that we looked at each other like October, November, and thought, you know, maybe we should do a more serious big year the next year, 2016. And one person that was helping us with our birding a lot was Ray had met a friend his age named Nick Ramsey, and they would go out with us. Uh, this is actually a day when one of the dead trees almost fell on us while we were birding. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, so we started our more serious big year on the coldest day of the year in Montana. It was about <laughs> minus 10 degrees on January 2nd when we went, when we got up. It was so cold that the birds were turning blue. <laughs> Nonetheless, we birded hard the rest of that day and through January and February. Um, but the birding was tough. There wasn't a lot out there. We did have some cool experiences like going out with Denver Holt, who's an owl biologist up there. And he, and he showed us long-eared owls and told us about his work with them. And I should tell you, that at the beginning of our big big year, we set a goal for ourselves of 250 species for the year. You know, we thought, okay, maybe we could do that. We didn't know if that was a lot or not too many, but that's what we shot for. Unfortunately, by the end of February, we were only up to like 58 species, something like that. Fortunately, though, I had arranged to take two trips out of state. The first was to Arizona, where a friend of mine, Bruce Whitey, who's a wolf biologist, had rented a cabin down there. And we went down there for four days, and it blew our minds. I mean, these birds were not only uh, incredible, they were different from anything we had in Montana. Uh, cactus winds, curved-billed thrashers, vermilion flycatchers. Even the gas station in downtown Tucson had a roadrunner behind it, right? <laughs> it was crazy. It was insane. And we came back from Arizona with about 120 species on our list. And we thought, you know, maybe 250 isn't ambitious at that. So we raised our target to 300. We had reason to be optimistic because a week later, we flew to Texas. Right? I was speaking at a library conference down here, and I told Brady, let's go early, and we will go and bird like for four days straight, and then you can fly home, and I can keep birding, or I keep working for uh, And again, just like Arizona, Texas birds blew our mind. You know, sussentail flycatchers, uh, American avocets along the shore in the Bolivar Peninsula, and uh, of course, we wanted to especially go to the Mecca of birding mentioned in the big year, High Island. Now, how many of you have birded High Island before? Okay, well, if you haven't, it's world famous because it is the first place that a lot of migrating birds see as they're going nonstop over the Gulf of 
Mexico. They're tired, they're weak, and they're looking for any place to land. The high island is often the first place for a lot of these birds. And we had a blast there. We especially wanted to find uh, warblers and other migrating songbirds, like prothonotary warblers and black fruited green warblers, summer tanagers. And we went uh, nearby uh, to another location there called the Brooker, which is just loaded with rosier spoonbills and all kinds of other great stuff. Now, after three hard days of birding, we were looking forward to a last fourth day of birding, which we were going to go to High Island again. And we woke up to one of Texas's annual 100 year floods, right? I mean, it was crazy. This was about three months before Harvey. And I think like 14 inches of rain comes on Houston in the 24 hour period. I could not find a place to burn. You couldn't even get to, uh, through the road to High Island. But we went all the way around Houston, got shut out every place, uh, got scared a number of times that we were going to disappear into a, some floodwaters. And finally, uh, near a place called Jessica's Park in Houston, we decided to just walk around the neighborhood and discover one last lifer of ours, a blue gross beak, which I saw on my field trip today. It was only the second blue gross beak I'd ever seen. That was the first one. Nonetheless, we came back from uh, Texas up to about 220 species. And again, we thought, gosh, maybe we should raise our goals here to 350 species. And again, we were optimistic because spring birding was in full swing back in Montana. We saw yellow-headed blackbirds, trumpeter swans, blue-footed boobies. Wait, wait, is anyone questioning whether we saw that in Montana or not? Okay, I threw that in because my generous in-laws happened to choose this summer to take me and my family to a place I've always wanted to go. Can you guess where it is? The Galapagos Islands. Yes. And we spent a glorious week aboard the National Geographic cruise. And the animals were just amazing. You know, a lot of times when you go to a place like this, you're afraid of being let down because it's been hyped so much. This place exceeded every expectation that I had. There were marine iguanas, the only lizards that dive into the ocean to graze on underwater algae. Their cousins, the land iguanas, were that, that split off from them about five million years ago on the evolutionary line. Famous land tortoises, and of course the birds were crazy. Three kinds of boobies. There were two kinds of frigate birds down there. Galapagos penguins. While we were down there, we happened to run into this guy. I always have trouble remembering his name. Uh, I think he called himself Chuck or Charles Darwin or something like that. And he told us, he was telling us about this group of finches he was studying. And he came up with some harebrained notion he called natural selection. You know, we laughed at it. I'm sure species are made that way. But, you know, it was an interesting theory anyway. Unfortunately, none of these birds counted for our big year list, right? Because they were all out of the country. And when we returned home to Montana, the birding was dead. It was August. There was nothing moving in Montana. But have you all heard the phrase, um, what is it? It's desperate times call for what? No, uh, that's not the version I've heard of. The version I know about is desperate times call for credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what you learned growing up? Oh, well, anyway, so I, the long and short of it is I decided we need to book one more trip because we were only up to about 280 birds, right? So I booked us a trip out to California. We took a pelagic birding cruise with Debbie Shearwater, who was um, actually the character in the big year was based on her, though she's out of Monterey, not up north, like they had in the book or the movie. And we spent uh, one uh, long all day field trip going from the coast all the way in. And it was incredible. We saw about 
90 birds, including uh, many lifers, including Lawrence's goldfinch here, uh, wren tits, uh, yellow-billed magpies. The problem is our last day of burning, we had a, a big issue. Like our flight out of San Jose was going to leave about 2 o'clock. And there was one iconic California bird we still needed. Can anyone guess what it is? California condor, right? But there was a conflict. I had made lunch reservations for our favorite Taiwanese restaurant in San Jose. And I and they're so booked, they're booked months in advance. And there was no way we could see condors and go to Jin Chai Fong in San Jose. So the night before I told Brady, you know. Can't do both. What will it be? And Kai said, Well, we have to look for condors. I said, You're right. The sacrifice is perfect. <laughs> the next morning, we headed down the coast near Big Sur to a place called Grimes Point, where condors have been sighted lately. We got there, got out, nothing. Right? <laughs> So we kept driving down the coast, down Highway 1, and suddenly saw a big bird. It was pulled over, looked at it, red tail hawk. So got back in the car, drove some more, another big bird, pulled over, turkey bird. Finally, we saw this guy staring through a spotting strip by the side of it. So we pulled it over and went up to him. He's kind of gruff, not very nice. He said, well, what are you looking for? Or looking at He said, now oh, there's some condors over that distant ridge there. I said, do you mind if we take a look? And he grudgingly said yes. And I could, I could see that they were condors because that's not a flash of light. But Reading looks at it and he got really upset and said, Daddy, I can't tell that these are condors. It's almost worse this way than if we hadn't seen anything at all, you know? So we get back in the car, we're driving back up the coast. He's in tears, really upset. I'm trying to talk him down a little bit, you know. And we're approaching Grimes Point again. And I didn't know if I should stop there again because it's on this blind curve, right? And I had to cross the traffic to get there. So the last second, I decide to go for it, just as a car comes whipping around the corner. But I slide into first base safe. And I'm coming into my heart's beating. And then I looked out through the front windshield. Free to get out of the car. And so we leap out of the car just as two giant birds disappear over it. Oh, not again. We sat there about 30 seconds later, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen happen. A flight of six California cars, like B-52s came soaring back over the hillside. This time there was no doubt what they were. And it was just one of the most incredible experiences we have ever had. And guess what? My flight was delayed and we still got to eat at Din Tai Fung later that day, right? Oh. There you go. <laughs> California, though, it did not get us to our goal. We kept burning hard the rest of the year. We picked up things like American. Pippet. The last day of birding, Braden, or of the year, Braden, his friend Nick, and I went birding and had probably the, the second most incredible birding experience of our holy year when a northern pygmy owl landed about 15 feet from us in a tree. We just sat down in the snow and we stared at each other for about 15 <laughs> minutes. It was great. We ended up with about 337 species together. And I have to bet, you know what? The number didn't even matter. What mattered was that this big year had allowed us to spend this incredible time together, learning new things, exploring places we never ever would have visited otherwise. And so it was just a remarkable thing for us as a father and son. And you think I got some good book ideas out of it? I did. In fact, um, I wrote my first adult book, Warblers and Woodpeckers, A Father, Son, Big Year of Burning. I wrote, uh, finally finished that woodpecker book I was going to write all those years before because now I had all the photographs I needed to write it. 
And I even wrote a book about evolution of those two iguanas down in the Galapagos. The problem is when you do something like this, it doesn't satiate, right? You don't say, okay, I've done it, I can stop. You just want to do more. In fact, the next year, my wife and I decided to do something we'd always wanted to do with the kids, and that is take them to a foreign country for an extended period of time. We decided to go to Peru and Ecuador for five weeks, and it took a long time to get there, especially because my horse was really slow. <laughs> but the first thing we did when we got down there was we headed straight to the Amazon. Now, this was not an official birding trip, but you can bet Raven and I were birding hard the whole time. Uh, right, we stayed at a place called Sandy Lodge, which I highly recommend. It's run by uh, local native peoples there. And we just birded our brains out. Right at the lodge, we were seeing incredible things like ringing trumpeters that just went and just adopted the lodge. And uh, my daughter especially bonded to that bird. But seeing things like white-eared jacobars, mass crimson canagers, Watsine, this is the bird you always see in every Amazon article or movie. The reason is they're everywhere. They're like turkeys, right? They're just, and they're loud and, and photogenic. And uh, sun bitters, which is a bird I'd never even heard of before I went down there. Our favorite thing we did was the uh, lodge had built, and a couple of other lodges had built this great birding tower up a giant K-pop tree about 150 feet tall. And so we uh, canoed down to it one day, went to the top, and right in the K-pop tree, we just saw amazing birds, um, things like blue daphnes, long-billed wood creepers, high puff birds, which was one of my favorite birds of the trip. And but we could also, from the platform, see out and look at different kinds of woodpeckers and toucans and other birds that were in the canopy. And at one point, one of the guides who was up there spotted this bump on the treetop about two miles away, got the spotting scope on it, and I, I couldn't even see it barely. And it turned out to be this bird here. Anyone know what this is? Heart. It's a harpy eagle, right? One of the largest uh, birds of prey on Earth. And something I never dreamed that we would actually see when we were down there. After the Amazon, uh, we, oh, well, I should say that our, all of our time was not on the game from the Amazon. At one point, we ran out of food and had to eat raw live beetle grubs. <laughs> Which is not an easy thing to do, actually. You know, they've got these big jaws or mandibles, and to, before you eat them, you have to bite behind the jaws and sever the nervous system, right? And so I did that and popped one in my mouth and chewed it up. And I've always read that they have a delightful nutty flavor when you eat them. Don't believe it. The thing tasted like a bag of snot. <laughs> But, <laughs> good point. <laughs> also, uh, another day, the lodge got attacked, and we had to fend ourselves off with um, blow guns here uh, when we were attacked by a whole group of marauding eggplants. And so, um, so and things weren't all fun and games in the Amazon. And there you go, we headed off to Peru where we saw more amazing birds like the Andean cock of the rock uh, and many kinds of hummingbirds. I threw a few extras in here for the festival uh, to show you the diversity of hummingbirds down there. Chestnut breasted coronet, Andean emerald. Um, one thing I started doing on this trip that I highly recommend that I'd never done before is I just started seeking out local birders to, to guide them. And so several times we just arranged to have someone pick us up in the morning and just take them off to take us to their local hot spots. And this, we saw a fairly rare bird called a many colored rush type that way while we were in Cusco. Uh, Andean flicker. 
Uh, our last few days of the trip, we went to a famous birding place called Mendo. Has anyone ever been there before? You've been okay. Oh, a couple people. Okay, and that was delightful too. They have a lot of uh, birds just everywhere, but people set up a lot of feeders too. You can see amazing birds at those feeders, like plain faced tanagers that you have here, which is one of more than two hundred species of tanagers in South America. Uh, this trip also stimulated some book ideas. I wrote a picture book uh, using photography called Birds of Every Color. And our adventures have not ended. Right before COVID, uh, I was invited to speak at an international school in Israel. And I, I took Braden over there two weeks early. And we saw the sites that mostly we birded. Uh, some friends of mine from many years ago picked us up, took us to a place called the Hula Valley, where 50,000 common cranes nest uh, every year, or up to 50,000. It varies quite a bit. And we saw the, the National Bird of Israel. Can anyone name this bird? Hupo, yeah, the Eurasian Hupo. And they behave a lot like flickers, too. You know, it's an interesting uh, convergence of behavior there. We saw uh, three different kinds of kingfishers, included white-throated kingfishers, and the analogous group of birds that's over in Europe. They don't have hummingbirds, but they have sunbirds, and they're fascinating. Um, I, I think it's it's really interesting. They have the same iridescent colors that hummingbirds have. They also are nectar sippers, and they do a lot of hovering, like. Hummingbirds, and I think that's just a fascinating case of convergent evolution that these two totally unrelated groups have evolved. And you wonder what shaped them to do that. It's just mind blowing when you think about it. One thing I really wanted to do on this trip was visit a couple of places I'd always dreamed about visiting. So, uh, right before Brady had to leave, uh, we walked across the border into Jordan, where we met another uh, local guy who took us up to a place called Wadi Rum in Jordan. Has anyone ever heard of Wadi Rum here before? Well, I know you've seen it because of the, has anyone here seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia or The Martian or Star Wars? All the, those scenes were filmed in Wadi Rum. In fact, during regular times, they have a steady stream of Hollywood movie companies coming to Wadi Rum to film there for the Martian like uh, place. We had to do our obligate camel ride when we were there and visit a place called Petra, which was a city built into stone by the ancient Nabataeans. I, I can never remember when, like 1400 BC, something like that. I'll have to look it up. And of course, we uh, got really lucky while we were in Wadi Rum and saw the national bird of Jordan, which is the Sinai rose finch. But the, the thing I, I really want to emphasize uh, here near the end of my talk is just how valuable it is to share your passions with young people. And all of you here know enough about birding to share what we know, even if you don't know very much. For my son, it's been an incredible journey that has just given him purpose in his life. For his eagle project, he decided to do a habitat restoration project to create birding habitat there. He has uh, gone out banding, bird banding, doing volunteer work like that. Uh, he's even helped me lead some young kids out into the burn forest to look for woodpeckers and other things like that. And all of this has just built up his confidence, his self-esteem, and um, not surprisingly, given him a purpose in life. In fact, about three weeks ago, I flew to Maine with him to drop him off at the University of Maine for the next four years and in the environmental sciences program there. And I have no doubt he's going to study birds. In fact, the clincher for this college and this university is as soon as he got there, he discovered an amazing birding spot, a hundred yards from his dorm, right? And he's been, he's got like 10 lifers there in the last three weeks. And so it's been amazing. But 
you know, Gerding doesn't have nearly the stigma it had when we were kids. He's taught his friends how to burn a lot of them. And, and, and we need as many burgers in the world as we can possibly get. I firmly believe that if we can figure out how to save birds, we can save ourselves. Because everything we need to do to save birds, we need to do to save human beings as well. Whether it's sustainable um, development or converting to renewable energy, all of them, designing cities that make sense instead of ones where we all have to drive our individual vehicles everywhere we go. All of these things are things that we need to do to help birds, but also to help ourselves and make sure we've got an inhabitable planet for future generations. And so uh, coming to a festival like this, I'm just so heartened by the enthusiasm for birds. And I hope, I, in fact, I know all of you will go home recharged and feeling, you know, what else can I do with these birds, you know? And I just encourage you to share whatever your passions are with other people in your life, especially young people that you might have in your lives. Just want to mention before I um, close, a couple of new picture books I have out this year. Uh, one is called Beaver and Otter Get Along, sort of, a story of grit and patience between neighbors. And uh, this, of course, uh, is about how wondrous beavers are in restoring habitat, and but also about, you know, all the other animals that use that habitat once the beavers, a keystone species, have come in and done their work. And a book that was inspired by that 2016 visit to High Island waiting for a warbler. After our visit, I was so impressed with what these birds have to do to get to their breeding sites that I came up with a story about the birds and their struggles to get across the Gulf of Mexico. And fortunately, my publisher, my editor, suggested, well, why not work in a parallel story about a family that's restoring their backyard habitat to make it bird-friendly in hopes that a cerulean warbler will decide to nest there. And so it's these two parallel stories and also a real optimistic story of hope that I hope you guys will check out. If you'd like to get in touch with me, um, you can do so through my website, snagyhealth.com. Um, I'm very easy to find. Uh, Braden and I also have, uh, since about 2018, 2019, been uh, writing a birding blog. And sometimes he writes it, Sometimes I write it. I'll be writing it more now that he's in college, to be honest, but I'm bugging him to send me some posts, right? And, um, and feel free to subscribe to that or share that information with other birders that you know. And uh, some of my books are for sale out there. I will go after I finish to autograph any that anybody wants. And with that, I just want to ask if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask about anything I talked about today. Yeah. I have a comment, and I'm glad you told us that the books are for sale. As you know, I have a little kid that I mentor uh, who's been birding since he was about five and he's about eight now. And I regularly give him copies of birding books, and they love it. And especially, he's always sharing them with his younger brother. And so I cannot, I'm a retired librarian, I cannot recommend highly enough that if you want to get kid inspiring to bird, give you your grandchildren, your children, whoever, friends, <laughs> kids, uh, birdie books, books that have birds, like the Rock Waiting for More Birds. Yeah. And Jeanette, by the way, has, I've just got a plug up here. So <laughs> uh, she's written a wonderful book on honey. Oh, and well. I was going to also say, I was not very familiar with the sunbirds that you were talking oh, about. Oh, yeah. But they did about 20 years ago find a um, fossilized hummingbird in Germany. Oh. And so it is possible that they split right. and the hummingbirds went out of existence, but the sunbirds are what ended up. I mean, very I mean, they are interesting. very similar. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Anyone yeah. else have any questions or comments or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, 
they're a little beefier than hummingbirds, as I remember. Um, and they're, uh, I, and I don't even know how many there are. Uh, there was only one in Israel. I know in Africa, probably there are more. And so, uh, but I, they just seem a little, yeah, beefier, like I said. Um, but, and they, and they didn't seem to me, the ones I was watching, that they're quite as skilled at, hum, at hovering as hummingbirds are, uh, but close, they could still do it. It is funny because every once in a while I'll be reading a book that's set in the Middle East or someplace in Europe, and they'll mention seeing a hummingbird, and I'm like, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although it was funny because uh, the military started using a little drone that looked like a hummingbird, and I was like, okay, so you're using that in the Middle East? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, see. Yeah. I was curious with the when you guys took the look at the warblers that you have the big storms come in. Have they done many much research on where the birds go to protect themselves during those kind of big storms? Or oh, oh, yeah. Well, it, it's. Um, in the, you, have you seen the movie The Big Year? No. Oh, okay. So there's a, a famous scene in there called Fallout. And so when there's a, a storm in the southern states, it often creates headwinds for these birds that are migrating, the lucky, unlucky ones that have left right when the storm is coming in. Now, when they, they hit that, they have nowhere to go. You know, I mean, I, I think I've heard of birds landing on ships and stuff, but I, it's very, uh, you know, that's dicey. I, they can't depend on that. And in fact, there can be really high mortality of birds. I, I remember talking to somebody who was uh, after a storm, oh, it was before our big year, and they said they, they went out to the beach and there were just hundreds of warblers on the beach, most of them dead. And so it's really a dicey thing uh, that happens to you. So if you were here after one week, we had been having a for several months. The ones that could leave left, the rest would die. And if you went out to some of the jetties, like out by Salt Lake and stuff, there would be just piles of telling bodies that just went against the jetties. So the trees were there. There were no leaves. We yeah. actually had a spring fall this year, it's like right out yeah. of And they were, yeah, a lot of them were on the shore. Some did hit boats. A lot of them landed in the water and didn't make it. But the island was covered with birds. It was an absolute phenomenon. It was wonderful. You also get a lot of birds that have blown out of their normal range. And if you're on a group like Bird Texas on Facebook, people are always reporting when there's a vagrant in the area. You know, bird is not supposed to be here, but it is. I mean, it would not have surprised me for you to see a movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, we've had some birds like that that were here because they've been blown up from the from the south. Yeah. If you want, um, if you want to get into birding even more than you are now, uh, a great tool is to sign up for eBird. Yeah. And if you if you haven't already, and one thing you can do with eBird is you sign up for rare bird alerts, mm -hmm. and, and so every day I get like 20 rare bird alerts for birds that are either not supposed to be in my area or are not supposed to be in the United States period or whatever. It's pretty interesting to see those and try to connect them to weather events and climate change and things like that. Anyone else? Well, I know you've had a long day. Uh, thank you for coming this afternoon and uh, just have a wonderful rest of your festival. Thank you. Can I do anything? No, I don't think so. I'm just, uh, I'm just going to get my talk here. It was interesting. That was delightful, Sneed. Thank oh, you so much. It's so nice to meet you. It's so, so nice thanks, to meet you. Thanks too. for staying for my talk. I'm so glad I did. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> and I'll be in touch a few months before we plan to publish your story. Perfect. That sounds great. I'll send you. <laughs> Who more. knows when it'll be?
<laughs> yeah, you know what? You should send me a copy of the book. And oh, can okay. review it in book oh, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd yeah. be great. Okay, right. thanks. Thank probably you. won't be me. But... <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, nice. Nice. But did, oh, can we get a picture of you guys together?